So why was the campaign so successful? First of all, it was student-led. There were floods of letters from students which kick-started the campaign. It was these student-led <coughs> initiatives which put pressure on local MPs and informed the debate on, on ESOL at local and at parliamentary level. We all know how important ESOL is. We tried to tell ministers time and time again that their plans would decimate support for some of the most vulnerable in our society and would cost the government more in the long run. My fellow MPs and I held debates about it in Parliament. We questioned ministers. We met students and teachers to hear their stories. But it is only through the tenacity of Action for ESOL that you forced the government to listen, to reverse some of their plans and to take the issue seriously. I mean, from my perspective, I don't think it's good enough for um, students of ESOL, for teachers of ESOL, for colleges and further education, adult education colleges, to be in this perpetual cycle of wondering where the money is going to come from in the next financial year. And I think it's very timely that you're putting together this manifesto uh, for ESOL, um, because whilst the immediate crisis point has perhaps been averted, um, that making the case for English language courses and finding a sustainable way of getting funding into those courses is absolutely critical over the next couple of years. ESOL provision is so often vulnerable because the educational dimensions of provision get overshadowed by issues of migration and citizenship. Because of this, it is vital that the voices of learners and teachers are not sidelined and forgotten. It just put me in mind of a, of a quote by Paolo Freire. He said, uh, dialogue without action is just talk. And action without dialogue is reactionism. And I think that the old Palace Yard, and, well, not just the old Palace Yard, but the way that the Action for Esau campaign ran itself reflected that phrase. Because we did talk, we talked, and then we acted. I've said that I think this manifesto is great, I think it's great to look at, I think it's, I think it's a beautiful design, but more importantly, I think it actually does set out what it intended to set out. It sets out a statement of beliefs, it sets in them out straightforwardly, it sends them out um, honestly and unequivocally. So the idea of doing a manifesto came out of the concern that ESOL was not only being threatened in terms of funding and fee remission, but it was being, the whole of the integrity of our profession was actually being um, threatened. And we were kind of on the brink of being put back into the margins. So given this threat, we thought, OK, we need to get ourselves together as a sector and talk about what our priorities are, what we think ESOL provision should be like, so that we can resist future threats so that we're solid as a profession rather than being constantly kind of, you know, at the whims of policy making. What we've tried to do is to link the struggle for ESOL to, or to see that struggle for ESOL as part of a wider campaign to defend adult education, but beyond to de the defence of adult education, to defend public provision and actually the whole notion of education as part of the public square. I think the manifesto offers a very different idea of what it is to be a professional educator, a sort of an activist idea of professionalism, a democratic idea of professionalism. I think that's in inherent in the manifesto, but it's exemplified by the nature of this campaign. And I think that's something that, that UCU more generally can learn from. Um, finally, if this was a ship, I'm going to read this, this wasn't my line, but I think it's, if this was a ship, we'd break a bottle of champagne to... Um, at the moment, but failing that, it's my pleasure to officially launch the manifesto and invite Dan to bring the glasses. Thank you. Thank you.